Cool. Thanks so much to Arwen and Colin for joining us today. This is going to be a very fun talk, I think. Um, Arwen is one of our amazing, courageous mums who's uh, done the course with us and continues to meet with, uh, with Ilka weekly. And uh, Arwen has introduced us to Colin. So Arwen, can you tell us how you've managed to bring us all together? I did, I did. It actually started on Instagram with a unicorn meme. I messaged him because there's a little unicorn meme. Um, but past that, we started talking and we come to find out how we are able to connect um, the spiritual side of life with neuroscience. And we've tried to find a way to infuse the two together. And on top of that, we both found out that we're parents. So I thought it was very interesting that we could find all the connections of becoming awakened parents and raising our consciousness and trying to divide the intuition in ourselves with the conditioning and healing ourselves within so we can heal our children as well. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. So cool. And Colin, <laughs> welcome. Thanks, Thanks so much for being with us. So awesome to have you on. So you're a dad so cool. and uh, a conscious dad. Very conscious, yes, but more, more, more conscious than un. <laughs> so, yeah, so thank you for that wonderful introduction, Arvin, and thank you, girls, for having me on. Um, I really wanted to speak tonight about anything that you want to throw at me. You know, I, I'm quite open that way, and I think more men should be open, they should be softer, and... We did speak, you know, we touched on it briefly about, you know, people kind of embracing the darkness, ex embracing the experiences, you know, there's no such thing as a good or bad experience in life, only experience, and this is where Alan Watts is one of my favourite guys that have ever walked the face of this earth, and, um, you know, it's about not being attached to that experience anymore, and being able to take that into kind of new realms, instead of living in the old ones. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> and you're, tell everybody where you're actually from, because uh, Arwen is in Florida. And where are you, Colin? I'm in Glasgow in Scotland. Yes, and we're in Australia. <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, Glasgow in Scotland, but it's, it's not the country it once was. The, the government seems to be playing fun and games with us at the moment, as they are all over the world, you know. So it's we've got to make the most of it, and we've got to have as much fun as we can. We've got to live our lives and still not allow what's being instilled into us through the media onto our children, which brings us back to this subject that we're on tonight, you know. It's how we can break that mould, how we can create a new kind of level of starseed, of indigo child, of crystal child, whatever you want to talk about, and we can put them in and allow them to be embraced and be loved and love other people the way that they're all meant to be doing it, you know, rather than the way that we've been divided since we were a very, very young age. And, and it's now worse and it's probably more prevalent now to put it in place than it was, you know, back then when I'm an 80s kid, so I was born in 83. And from the 80s right the way through to about 99, life was good. Life was good, you know? Yeah. Uh, and we spoke about it, obviously, we, we, love, we all live in the country. I'm a country boy. I get brought up in the country, you know, we were allowed to go and cycle age six. We could cycle eight miles away from home in the morning, not come back till six o'clock at night and for your dinner. And nobody would ask any questions because the media hadn't got really in too much control of everybody. So nobody was really scared, you know? Yeah. People didn't yeah. really want to think about the bad things where it's now fears instilled in everybody. And I do believe this is what's affecting the kind of parenting with everybody. We also didn't have uh, mobile phones to be able to sit on all day and give your children, you know, that that extra time where folk are now sitting with their faces stuffed in their phone um, and, and not giving, you know, look at this mum or dad, look at this grandma or grandpa, look at this, yeah, I'll see it in a second, or yeah, that's nice, you know, it's, it's, it's not pleasant, you know? So I know a lot of people are guilty for it and I used to be myself. Um, I would rather sit on my phone than, than be consciously in the room. It's not that I didn't want to look after my child. It's because these addictive dopamine, serotonin, you know, all these things that we, oh, it's not serotonin, sorry, it's like dopamine and, and all these endorphins that we get through likes and attention and drama and all these things, 
we usually get addicted to these more than we do addicted to our children. And this is where we, where I believe that we should be addicted to our children and give them the best upbringing in their life for their way possible. You know, it's like anything that we can do for them, we should be serving them in every way possible. It's not parenting is the same as being a leader, but you've got to serve your employees if you're a leader, don't you, if you're in a business. You've got to serve them to make them grow and nourish and, and, and come into it. You've got to do the same as a parent. You've got to serve your child. Oh, my child. Yeah, that's a pretty, time. yeah, that's a pretty radical concept to serve your child because we're brought up authoritarian style parenting, most of us. Yeah. And it's like the parent knows more than the child. So, which is not something that we subscribe to in uh, at, like in our group. We, re we re believe the same as you, like that children are really evolved there, that yes, the star seeds, the, all these names that they, they have for kids these days. So, so if you were to speak more to how you actually do that on a daily basis with your child, what does that, what does that look like, Colin, to be like really okay, present so, and be so serving your child? So cool. I live full time my daughter just now. My daughter's 15 months old, you know, and it's all for, for me, it's about, it's that interaction. It's that having the time that I have with her away from work or away from what I, I'm doing elsewhere. The time that I have with her, it's all about understanding, you know, and, and prompting and, and these type of things, you know. And we spoke, we touched briefly on how we shouldn't control a child, but if we see them going to stick their fingers in a socket, or go and touch something sharp, or they might be able to fall and smash their face on something. Go make a noise so that they know not to do that, you know? Um, so they say, but in terms of, do you know, many, and I'm going to talk from my dad's perspective, I can't talk from a woman, okay? You're far more special than what a man is, right? You, you created that in there, you, you've got a different, softer approach, you've got all these different things. However, there's a kind of a, there's a different type of safety with a man, and I don't want to make that sound as if I'm putting yeah. anyone down. You yeah. you girls and you women have got everything touched on, but there's just something with a father and a child, a conscious father and their child that can't be broken no matter what. It's like they might lash out at the mum because the mum's so caring and soft, and do you know. But then the dad comes in. It's just it's just that presence. It's a different energy altogether that they hold on to, and it's a different kind of you know. Why do they behave for you and not for me? Or why do they not do that for you? It's like, we have got differences as human beings, you know? And it might be my style. I do believe there's a difference between a masculine and feminine uh, for, a for a child. And, and I do believe the system has, is kind of taking that away from, from the system as well, uh, from, the, from the children. You know, everything's now about, and I don't mean for everybody, but there's a lot about courts, there's a lot about split ups, you know, that it should only be with the mum or no, the dads have got half rights and everything's a fight now, rather than understanding what a child needs in its life, you know. Um, so for me, it's all about, I love to sing, I love to dance, I love to make funny noises, I love to, you know, interact with the toys and the books and, and read and, you know, and, and kind of copycat games, these type of things, because I feel that it's more of a tangible learning development you know, for me, and that's where our bond is. Like, my son, my son's nearly, he's nearly 11. And all the way growing up, again, for him, it was dancing, dancing, dancing. That was it. So from the age of like two and a half, I had him dancing on his own to Michael Jackson, doing spins and all sorts of cool stuff, right? And because that's what I was into, but this takes me on to my next subject, if that's all right. I don't believe projecting what you like onto your child is right. You know, it's about what you do. If your child adapts that and wants more of that, by all means. But you don't take your child away from what they want to do because you like to do it. You know, so you see these people that, oh, I wish I was a ballet dancer, so I'm going to put my child into ballet. But the child's into playing the piano. It's like, what are you trying to do here? It's, so sometimes the, being conscious, about not just being conscious of yourself, but it starts there but it's being conscious of the energy of the behaviours and things of who, who you've brought into this world. Are you wanting to control them so that when they get older, they're then controlled by the media, they're then controlled by their friends, they're then controlled by all this shit. And it's like what you're doing and what you instill in your child, if you ask them to be free, they're going to be free, but they're going to inspire other people to be free as they go older. If you try and control 
and project. That's all that they're going to see the world as. And that's what's happened to, to a lot of us until we kind of came through our awakening. You know, we, we came through our awakening at different stages, through different ways. Mine was kind of through trauma and loss. Some people is through just being enlightened, through just taking a journey. Some people are through happiness. It comes to us in all different ways. So when it came to me, it was like, I'm just, I'm so aware of what's going on now. And even when you're watching kids' cartoons, I mean, it's the, the subliminal programming is absolutely horrendous, horrendous, horrendous. And it's like, my daughter loves Moana. Like, she, she, she absolutely loves it. Like, so it reminds me of kind of Arvin's background there. Um, do you know, the island of Motanui and the, all the, and, and the music's great and she gets up and she shakes her wee bum and, do you know, she just loves dancing and stuff like that. She, she's really good, right? But some of the stuff they talk about in it is just, it shouldn't be spoken about for children, even though they don't understand it's there. You know, the unconscious brain takes in everything you've ever seen, thought and heard through your whole life and it keeps in there. And there's no such thing as any artificial intelligence system that's ever going to be more powerful than a human brain, you know? Yeah. The only way it's going to be more powerful than a human brain is if the AI is programming the brain and then it becomes more clever because it can then detect what we are going to be doing, you know, by searching our search engines and our maneuvers and where we're going and all these things. So once we realise that the human brain is so much more clever than anything that will ever be on this earth, ever, ever, I don't care if you're Bill Gates and you get the biggest computer system in the whole entire world from a baby from that nurturing what you're doing that tiny little brain is going to be where that adult's going to be and if you want to try and do that whole control and non-expressive and whatever and we'll talk about other subjects before i keep i could rant all night i'm a disaster right but we'll, we'll, we'll talk know. about other <laughs> I knew this before she introduced us by the way um so like I would like to hear, obviously, your girl's thoughts, maybe on what I've said, or, or how like we can open up the conversation more. Because I want to go into labels, and I want to go into these types of things as well. Because 2021, the world loves a label. Let's face it: you can't eat your dinner without being a certain type of person. You can't go and breathe in air without being a certain type of person. You can't actually get out of your bed without being a certain type of person or a, or a certain behavior. Do you know, you can't have an off day or you're a fucking lunatic. Do you know what I mean? It's, I mean, the whole world just going a bit mad. So I would love to open this up to you, beautiful girls, and, and you can tell me <laughs> where you want to go. Yeah, I reckon before we go there, perhaps um, earlier we spoke about awareness, like how you came to to be aware you mentioned that it was through trauma and for the majority of us I, I think it is um but what that looked like before you were aware and what it looks like now okay nice question i like that thank you um so i explained in a brief five minute chat before we came on that i was one of five boys i was eldest out of five boys uh, my mother was on her own for 14 years with five kids, five boys. So you can only imagine what she's like. She's a fucking superhero, right? I don't care what anyone says. Regardless of how things turned out, yeah, absolutely. But regardless of how things turned out, you know, for us, for her, for whatever, she did her absolute best. And this, and this is what I want to say to all the parents watching. Just do your absolute best, but be more conscious of your little one and, and yourself, you know, and not looking at old ways, trying to kind of, change things up and try and renew it but because from a young age maybe 14 years old 13 14 i was coming home washing school uniforms helping make dinner you know taking the dog out getting all the boys ready while mum was still working and and this kind of went up so i had a childhood i had a good childhood i had lots of love for my mum and but we used to see her upset and things like that as well so my main thing i'm a compassion guy right I need to feel somebody and serve them in whatever way that I possibly can to make them feel better, right? And I'll take on, I'll, I'll bear that pain and that's who I am as a person. So I bear a lot of pain growing up, not because it was put on to me, because I chose to take it, okay? And because there are a lot of people in the world that are compassion server people, and this is talking about the intangible drivers, the, the model for the mind and brain that I work with with John Lenhart. Compassion server people 
a lot of them growing up feel sorry for themselves. Even as adults, they feel sorry for themselves because they don't know that they're a compassion server and it's their choice to take on the pain of others to then serve, to give it back. So what happens is you get a lot of poor me's. I was a lot of poor me's. I was a lot of, you know, they don't give me back. They, they, they don't do enough for me. These type of things. So when it came to the, this awareness and this coming back, I joined the army. I joined the yeah. army. I'm nearly 31 years old, right? That's an old army fucking soldier, right? I'm sorry, right? You're not joining yeah. and racing against 17, 18, 19 year olds doing six mile runs and half marathons and stuff like that when you're 31. No, don't do it, anybody. So when, when I kind of came on to this, what I found was um, like I'd been going through like, a hard time through like, a, a bad marriage breakdown, which happens to the best of us, you know, so again, society, family and everything against who we are and who we were, it just didn't happen, so it get more bitter and bitter and bitter and bitter, and there was no physicalities, there was no, you know, there was nothing bad, there was no crimes caused, but it just gets so far gone that the main purpose of that child wasn't, it was no longer an issue, it was tit for tat, back and forward, tit for tat, back and forward, and no one realised what was happening with, with the little one, so... And then, then the new man came on board and then it just went tits up from there. I wasn't, it wasn't allowed to call me dad anymore in the house and all that. I mean, it went really deep. It was really terrible and traumatic for him and God knows how that's going to affect him when he's older. But did my best, joined the army to get, can I get away from the situation so there was no drama, but obviously better myself and lose the ego that I had through being a performer. I was a performer for 10 years. I won't get into how or what, <laughs> but I was a, I was a dancer for over ten years, and um, you, you'll get the drift. I'm sure you're not daft. So, <laughs> so, <your> shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was um, I joined the army to, to better myself, not because I don't like the monarch, I don't like the government, I don't like control. I'm a bit of a nomad, I'm a bit of a wild character, I'm a bit of a free spirit. But I had to go in there to lose who I was or who I'd made myself through the years of taking on other people's shit and through all the situations and stuff. So that was my space of solitary. Didn't have many friends, took a bit of a hard time, you know, mentally, physically. And I was like, I went really like, kind of really downhill when I was in there. So I was either sink or swim at one point. And at one point I thought I could just let myself sink and just go. I was like quite happy to, and I thought, no. So then I joined the army boxing team. And again, you're fighting all these young guys, or big massive guys, you know, and I, I wasn't a fighter, I'm a compassion guy. If somebody wants to fight, I'll, I'll happily just cuddle them. <laughs> do you know, and say, it's okay, it's fine. What can I do for you? It's, it's okay, you're angry. I'll help you, you know. But what actually happened was I joined the boxing team because... Um, I had to know that I had to defend myself, you know, because I was always quite scared growing up because I'd never been a fighter. And I always had to know that I had to protect myself or be able to protect my kids or my family or, do you know, anybody, do you know, in that situation. And I knew I could, but I doubted it. So anyway, I did. And it came to my first actual match. And because of the punches weren't actually sore when you're in and you're in that ring and you've got everyone watching you, I get really bad damage to my nose. And I lost my taste and my smell um, through the boxing match. And then I was leaking brain fluid and I was in hospital. And, I, and it was quite, it was pretty heavy duty. Um, so then when I came out of it, I was like, couldn't go back to normal work. Really, really depressed. They'd taken me off. You're not allowed to use weapons. You're not allowed to do this. And then it was like, it got deeper than that again. Oh, don't fucking talk to him. He's a lunatic. He's, a, he's depressed. He's, you know, they were just, just horrible Toxic, that's what I class as toxic masculinity, right? It's when men together can't just be one in love, right? Toxic masculinity is not what I believe society is putting onto women, right? That's society playing both sides, right? And, and I'll be open and honest with that. Toxic masculinity is when men are all together and then one's got to be bigger than the other one, or one's got to be harder, or they've got to, you know, these type of things. And that situation wasn't good for me because I was soft. I was the alpha because I was able to be soft, you know, 
And what they did, they didn't get the reaction that they wanted, so there was never conflict, and you would always be able to take them down with words because most of them are fucking thick. So they did, they did, and I don't think that's a bad way, right? But they didn't like that, so they had to try physically harder. They had to, you know, push and poke. So I did get to the point where I was ready just to lose the, the everything, just go, do you know what, fuck this. But then I says, no, I don't. I'm going to just go. So I then managed to get out a year and a half early before um, a year and a half early before my time was up because through medical kind of restrictions managed to get out and while I was in so obviously I spent a lot of time in my room on my own now where most men would probably like to go and watch dirty videos I then spent time watching um, conspiracies and different ways of working and do you know the way the brain and, and these type of things and taking myself away from the, the typical norm of thinking so I literally had time to reprogram my own brain to open my own neural pathways by going against myself not going against the planet not being an activist for fucking everybody in the world but going against myself the one that matters most in my life you know and then I went into myself and everything and it was so uncomfortable to try and believe something that that I knew was right but then it's only because I was told so I was like being a scientist you're being your own scientist you know Real science is proving yourself wrong in every possible way before you can get the truth, you know? And this is what I did. So then that was a bit of a long story, but that is how I awoke. I became awakened and more conscious. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Amazing. Amazing journey there. <laughs> I'm sure you can get on a rant around labels. Ilka, would you like to start there? <laughs> well, I thought we could even, like, Arwen came to us, you know, and you, you'd you had your uh, run-in with the world of labelling. Would you like to speak a little bit about that, Arwen, and how that, you know, your journey as a mother with that world where your children get a label or people try and give them a label? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll start with... Um... My son was diagnosed with autism when he was three years old. And at that point, I was not awakened at all. I had no idea what awakening even was. Um, I was very in the matrix and I just did what I was told. I listened to the doctors. They said he needed to be in ABA therapy. He needed all these sessions done. If he didn't get these done, he would not survive in society on his own. And it put me into fear and panic and survival mode. Um, I had no idea what autism was. So I just tried to do research and it was all negative. I tried to do support groups and they were all just despair and sad and they just felt so hopeless. Um, so I ended up going down that road for about two and a half years. Um, he went into ABA therapy. He was traumatized by ABA therapy because when you put a child in a situation that they don't wanna be in, they're gonna react. If they don't react externally, they're gonna react internally. And by doing that, it actually increased his symptoms to where he like completely shut down and he physically got ill. And I just didn't know what was going on. I, I was like, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing what I'm being told what's happening. And then something clicked one day when I took him out of ABA therapy, all of a sudden I was just like, I can't take him back here. I just can't do it. Um, and it's still been a journey. He hasn't been in ABA therapy, which is applied behavioral analysis. What they do is they assess your child and they decide the best outcome to make him fit in with society, which really should have been the indicator right there. But anyway, um, one day it just clicked and he's still working on still being traumatized to this day. It's been over a year and he's still afraid to get in the car because he thinks he's going back. Um, but besides that, when you fully become aware of who your child is, not who you want them to be, not why you want them to fit into the society, when you just listen to them, they start to open up. And that's with everybody in the world. When you start listening to who they are, not who you want them to be, not who society wants them to be, fuck the labels. Seriously, every single label in this world should not exist. Even the word ego, it's a belief system. 
it's conditioning. All of this is just conditioning. If you wipe away conditioning, you are left with your intuition and you know who your child is, you know who you are, and you can just understand each other to the very core of your being. And it's just really upsetting that we've gotten to this point to where we've lost who we are. So we don't know who our children are. So what we need to do is do the inner work. We need to do the inner work within ourselves break the conditioning that we were given from our parents because a lot of it comes from our parents and once we're able to separate what our parents have taught us to what we know intuitively then we can become better parents we can become awakened parents yeah could you could you share a story about some of the things that have changed since you've started doing that inner work with yeah with you and with your with with your son yeah, um, well, we started doing the every week awakened parent sessions in, what was it? Was it October, I think? Um, and back then I was so anxious, just the thought of my son, he couldn't stand being like five feet from me. I had to keep an eye on him. And now I could, I just, I let him go. Cause I know I trust him now. I know what he's going to do. He understands what I'm doing. He knows what I'm doing is helping me. He understands that now. Um, between doing the awakened parent stuff. I also read nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, the radical unschooling book by Dana Martin. Just, I'm not his dictator. I'm not going to raise him the way I want him to be. I'm going to give him the resources. If he wants to learn something new, I've got you. I will bring it in. I will teach you the world. And a big thing today is we think we can throw a TV in a child's face and they're going to learn everything. There's some education from a TV. Yes, that's true. But that's where you learn. Out there. You become in tune with nature. You become in tune with yourself. And the more you break off from what society says you need to do to become whole and you just follow what you're supposed to do. I listen to his words. I don't try to project what I think he's going to mean behind them. If he says he's sad, I'm not going to go, oh, well, he's sad because I didn't give him the last chicken. I'm going to ask him like, where are you feeling it? The big thing I do is I ask him where he feels the sadness because sometimes he can't verbalize it and you can't always verbalize how you're feeling. So you might have to go with a physical touch or I don't know, just being there for them. And the more they trust you, the more they can open up and show you different parts of who they are because they're not going to feel comfortable with you until you feel comfortable with yourself. Yeah. And for example, today was the first day my son slept in his own bed by himself. And the last time he did that, he was a year old. And um, it was when he got really sick with the flu and almost died. So I created a fear of if he sleeps in a different bed, I won't be able to take care of him. He might get sick again. He might almost die again. So I worked through that with you. <laughs> we, we worked on that a lot. And all of a sudden, in the last week, I was like, I think he's ready. He's taught himself how to pee by himself and go to the bathroom by himself. Like, I just completely let him do it by himself instead of following him around now. And he slept the best sleep in his life. And I did too. Oh my God. <laughs> like, I haven't slept alone in a bed by myself in 10 years. And I don't know if I'm ever going to sleep with anyone ever again. But... <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna sleep in a different bed no but um there's just so many things so many things that have changed within how many months it's been five months and he's he's acting like a different person because I'm a different person I, I'm completely opposite of who I was I was in a fear state on top of being bed bound for the last two years now I'm feeling like myself, which didn't exist until now. Like it was deep in there. Okay, and wait two seconds. I'm gonna take the bone off this dog because the noise she's making with it's mental. But two seconds. <laughs> oh, and how old is your son now? My son's six years old now. Okay. Yeah, and it's just but so. So it was around five years that, um, like, from when he was one, uh, 
to to now, it's been five years, and just recently he slept in his own bed. Is that right? Today, today is the day that he first slept in his own bed, and yeah, so it's been five years where it's just me and him, and I know that did um a bit of damage to my marriage at the time because he, my husband at the time, would end up sleeping in a different bed, and then it became a different room. Um, and so it was just me and my son. And I was just like, at this point where I was like, okay, he can't be 40 years old and sleeping with me. I mean, he could, but I'd prefer not that. <laughs> I don't want that. So I was just like, it felt like it was time. I felt like I wasn't going to rush it. I felt like he has been stepping into himself so much lately. I was just like, let's give it a shot. And it worked. And I'm just excited. I'm like, oh, what else is he going to do on his own now? It's just like a spark of inspiration. Yeah, can I just say it's it is though because you decided to show up for yourself, Arwen. That is the main reason that these changes have happened. You you made that choice to commit to that. Yeah, yeah. They, they have to show up. People people can you know say oh we did you know we're doing that, but you're the one who has to show up. Yeah, and I was talking to my friend Alex earlier about how I have so many plans for us. My plan is to build my income, hire a traveling nanny. And so I want him to know to not put his life on hold because of other people around him. I want him to understand that just because he has children doesn't mean his life has to stop. And yeah. by yeah. empowering myself and taking him with me to, to help other people around the world, he gets to see all these people I'm helping. He's gonna be like, wow, I can do anything. There is literally no limit in this life. You can do anything in this world. If someone says it's impossible, scratch that out of the dictionary and say, I can do this and I'm going to do this because it's, it's just so delicious when you get to that point. <laughs> Before you came to this work, did you have any understanding of this huge concept that to change what's around me, I first have to change what's inside me? No, I was a victim. I was 100% a victim and I took zero responsibility for my actions. Like that's the first thing you need to realize is you need to take responsibility for everything you say, everything you do, everything you feel. And when you're in the victim mindset, everyone else is to blame. But once you, every time, for example, I was in an argument with someone the other day and usually back in the day, I would immediately be like, why are they saying this to me? Like, I can't believe they would do this to me. But now I immediately go into, they're projecting out of fear or pain or guilt or shame, something that's happened in their past. This is not about me. They are just talking at me and I need to come to a place from understanding and compassion. And I just, I let them talk because in the end, it's just like, it's like their inner child's just trying to speak out what they've always wanted to say. Anything that anybody does to you is not to you. It's, it's them. They're just projecting. And so it's like a completely different perspective now to where every single encounter I make, I come from a place of love and understanding and nothing in that way is about me. Now the world does revolve around us in a way, <laughs> in a way of we need to put ourselves first in certain situations like that. But it's just mind blowing how when you do the inner work, it's like um, it's like a cloud or like a fog's been lifted and you can see everything now. You can see so many different perspectives and viewpoints. And the tricky part is I have friends coming to me for advice. I do not give advice and they get really pissed off. And they're like, why aren't you giving me advice? I'm like, well, anything I say you already know the answer to. So if I give you advice, there's already something in you going no or yes. So I'm like, why should I give you the advice if you already know the answer inside? So what I do is I just ask the questions, certain questions and they're like, oh, I already have the answer. So it's yeah. like, we, we're all capable of being aware. We just don't realize how aware we actually are because of the conditioning we were brought up with, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sometimes it's not the conditioning we're brought up with. Sometimes the condition of the way that we live, you know. So again, it's not. I get what you're saying, hundred percent. And 
a lot of people it is from how they grow up uh, and they stay in that way of life for their whole life which means they haven't actually lived their own life their whole life you know so then they get older and then they try and change it but what they do is they habituate to another way of life so maybe a rebellion which again they're not living a way of life they're living a constant fight which doesn't allow them to be open either and I think when people even find, and, and, I, and I definitely did, when I left the house, because I, I didn't go and get into trouble and get brought home by the police and, you know, smash windows and do all the things that I did as, as all the, the kids do, throw eggs at people and stuff, whatever they do in Scotland, right? I didn't do any of these things, right? So I went off the rails as I got older, and I didn't do any of these mad things, but what I did was I drank lots, I maybe went out and took class A drugs, I partied all the time, like, life didn't really matter. This was before kids, you know, this was before my kids. And I went out and, and obviously I was in the kind of performing art. So then you were more parties, more alcohol, more, 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 more. And everything was more, 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 and you wanted more, 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 but you were really feeling less, less, less. And then I was stuck and habituated into this kind of way of life. And that's where the army came from, you know? So then the conditioning I knew I had to break, I had conditioned from childhood, then I'd condition myself in the adult life to pretend that life doesn't really fucking matter. I can be a child for as long as I want and I don't need goals. I don't need responsibility. I don't need any of these things. And then my son came at 27 and he changed that. That was to, he changed it a lot and my life was dedicated to him. But then when the, the marriage breakdown came and, you know, can I go into that again? I habituated to other ways of working when he wasn't there. So then three days a week, I was that dad. And then it got down to two days a week. Then it was two days a fortnight. And then, do you know, and that was taken from me. It wasn't that I gave it away. It was taken from me through the system, through breakdowns of communications and, and whatever else. So it slowly came down. So then I habituated into it again. The other night that it wasn't there, it was the alcohol and the women and the, all these things. So again, it was like then in like a third phase of who I need to be because this is the way that I feel not taking taking, um, as Aaron was just talking about, you know, not taking responsibility, not taking anything on the chin, like, well, maybe you could have been a better husband. Maybe you didn't have to go out and perform all the time. Maybe you took your work more seriously more than your wife. Maybe, oh, fuck, it's right, so it wasn't all them. No, it wasn't. It was you, you and them, and you both let it happen, you know? And it's not until you get to the point where that you can look at yourself and the other person at the same time and again, this takes you back to your child and then how that you can grow and how you can communicate as that one, it's one baby, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm talking to you three girls at the moment. We're all one because we're all in this conversation. We're engaging. It's the same, you just need to do the same with your child. You need to understand them, feel them, and then speak to them the way they want to be spoken to, not the way that you think you should speak to them. The same as you do everybody, you know, and this is where I've been learning about the mind and the brain and having that I've introduced to John Lenhart, who's over in Wisconsin, in America, um, and I'm going to work with him over in the States. I'm actually moving from, this, from Scotland. Did you, did John Lenhart, who are you saying? What? Which name are you saying? John Lenhart. Oh, Lenhart, okay. Oh, yeah, the one yeah. I've seen you do the videos with, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. He's literally, yes. he's, he's a chemical engineer and a chemist, so he's got a special kind of brain, um, and he knows how to, he knows how to articulate it, because of my complicated way of thinking or intuition, whatever, I wasn't able to articulate the same thing that he can say. And now what's happened is he's now taught me how to let it come out of my mouth rather than feel it and hold it in and suppress it. You know, and this is where I'm, I'm now, not only do I see things and feel them, which has always been the case, and I did try and suppress it with alcohol and whatever, now I'm able to express that. And this is where you girls are as well. You're able to express yourself to your child in a healthy manner uh, and not project. So there's a difference. And, and I don't think enough people know the difference between expression and projection. They all come out, but one's truth and one's not. And this is where we find that it's, it's a very, very powerful thing when we're able to differentiate from the two and then we're able to understand what our child actually sees. You know? And sometimes you don't have to say anything to your kid. Sometimes you can sit there and be quiet for two hours and just watch them play and make sure they're safe. You know, you don't have to be constantly touching them. You don't have to be constantly speaking to them. 
you know, just let them, just watch them, understand them, gauge them, you know, and I think this is, again, people can overdo it, but then go back to the phone thing, people can totally underdo it, so then they are playing themselves, they are self-sufficient, but then later on in years they're not able to express themselves because they've never had to, because no one's asked for it, because they're stuck to an iPhone or a tablet or a television, you know, and it's, it's about having that balance. As Arvin said, I'm quite happy to put a more in front of a movie, you know, and, and to do that. But I'm also, you've got to find that balance. You've got to take them away from it. Turn the television off when they're eating their dinner. Not because I want to take it away from them. Because I need you to understand that I'm feeding you, I love you, and I want you to feel fed. I don't want you looking over there. Your dinner's getting cold, yeah. you can't enjoy it. Do you know, you've yeah, got they- to have some sort of rules. Yeah, and well, I, I don't know. I, for me, the thing is, um, whenever whenever you have to turn something off, you kind of like you're saying that it has the power. And for me, I I grew up where we had, you know, the news and stuff was on in the house, of course. But my dad would constantly tell me it was a load of bullshit, constantly. So the television is on, but I listen to his voice much more than I listen to what's on the news. Like I respect his voice more. I want to please my dad more. And yeah, I think this yeah. is the thing that we forget. With we, we have a say in how we interact around media as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. So if you're, what, what I always say to parents too, is if like their kid's playing Minecraft or the kid gets interested in something, even if it's something that you don't actually really agree with, you know, they're, they're often, and I learned this from Dana Martin, it's like they're often doing it for totally different reasons to what you are. Even watching um, sitcoms and things that you think they're watching it for a certain reason, but unless you sit down and actually ask them and have a conversation with them, but you're allowed to have your opinion too. You know, so yeah. it's, it's also teaching children that adults have their opinion about things. Like my dad would say every ad on television was just bullshit. It was a money-making scheme. It was, uh, you know, he, he right. knew back then. So of course I've grown up and I don't subscribe to the stuff. And I said the same thing to my kids and they know. So, so it's like who has the loudest voice in some ways too. Yeah. And that, that, you, that it's not just a matter of turning it on and off or that it has the power, we have the power too. And we, we can and we can use it as a tool in that way to show that there are there are ways of hypnotizing you. You yeah. can even have yeah. those kinds of conversations with your children going, and my kids, they they totally like they're like, oh mum, we've heard it all before because I've said it. So I mean, I was a little <laughs> bit like my dad growing up because he, he would, you know, constantly tell us about the world. And he got me to read books about how the world brainwashes us. And, you know, I read books on um, communist brainwashing techniques when I was 16 um, because he asked me to read them. And so so it's like, you know, education. Use Everything is an educational tool, including stuff that we think, oh, my God, that, you know, teach them about the symbols they put into those things. Like I've learned about symbols in my life. I, I tend to see so many different things, like so many metaphors in everything because I know how to read symbols. And I, mm. I started learning that when I was 10. So it's like it's like you, 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 you take the power back from what they're doing in the media. Yeah. You start yeah. learning about it and, what they, and how they can put subliminal messages in and all yeah. these kind of things. Because once your children are awake to that, they're going to hear it in a totally different way. And they're not going to, like, it's not, it doesn't have the power anymore. And, yes, it can. I mean, it's very hypnotic. It's extremely hypnotic. The old, you know, you see the M sign and, oh, my God, I've got to drive into the McDonald's and get my burger because it's made a link in the brain with the the M sign means, you know, they they know how to put the food on there so it looks really delicious and your mouth starts watering. But have a conversation with your children about this stuff. Like, show how, because, because again, I mean, then you can use these tools too when you've got a girlfriend and you want to influence her to be your girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. You can say, <laughs> to your you know, how you're like in a way that's like juicy and McDonald's talk. Like, you know, you know, show her your juicy, you know, Big Mac. I mean, I'm just telling you that. But it's, but it's like, this is how you can learn. You know, they, they're just using tools on us, but we have the, the a very, very powerful tools. that They know how the brain works, the media industry. Yeah. They really yeah. do. But start learning how your own brain works and use their, their, their amazing, you know, 100%. Stuff it. Yeah. And, so, and, and I understand, Ray, and I 100% agree with you in what you're saying. And like, yeah. there's 
there's no right or wrong. And the way that I was expressing was like, if I turn it off, everything just becomes present. Do you know, and that's the way that I feel. So it's not, uh, yeah, I can totally take her away from the television. I can take her away from everything because I do have that power to be able to create that fun and so she forgets about yeah. it. Yeah. But it's also nice for me in the way that I believe is to be able to press that off button when it goes to darkness and silence. And then it's only our voices. It's only our thoughts. It's only our feelings. And it's, I don't do it because, you know, I, as much as I said, I would like her to, to look at me when she's feeding her dinner. If I've got Moana on, she, there's, there's nothing going to take her away. That's not power. That's just what she enjoys. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So she enjoys it rather than, I can say, okay, we'll turn it on in a minute. She doesn't understand. She's, she's 15 months. But if I say, it's okay, it's good, it's nice, ha ha, smiles, and then turn it off while I'm smiling, she knows it's not a bad thing. And then yeah. you can back on, you know, but and she, I can smile. And she wants to engage with you, of course. Of course. Like, it's when a, when a parent wants to actually engage with their... I've had the parents in our course say this to me all the time, that if they do actually ask their child to stop something because they want to engage with them, and they really do want to like i'm going to play cricket with you right now do you want to do that like and they're tr truly coming from their heart in that statement it's not like i'm the child, I'm, knows. The child knows the child knows and this is again the the of doing doing the inner work because if it's coming yeah. from a place of like oh well i'm just going to fit you in for five minutes and then i'll go back to what i'm well, doing i had this conversation last week so I think language for us is a thing that was made up to control us, I'll be honest. So animals don't, they don't talk, they bark for danger, they bark for awareness, but they don't speak, they understand. Kids understand, they look at facial expressions, they, they feel the energy, they feel all these things that we were closed off to for a certain length of time through our life until we were able to open up back up to them again. You know, and this is why I said earlier that we can sit and we don't have to speak to them. We can do things and we can move and we can see and, and they can see our face and they can see these things. And it's a really beautiful thing to be able to do and, and interact without any noise or without any kind of verbal interaction. Obviously, we all need to speak to be able to understand what we all want. But in order just to feel happiness from them or for them to feel it from you, you don't have to tell them. They don't have to tell you. You know, we can feel it. And if that's not right, that's the point where we can change our behaviour make them feel safer, change our behaviour to make them more engaged, to make them more understanding, whatever it is that we need to do. And that was, Aaron caught on that, where do you feel the sadness? You know, is it in your throat? Is it in your ears? Is it your chest? Is it your stomach? You know, it's where do you feel that? And it's this, again, going back to this kind of primal parenting. thing, you know, going back to before three, four hundred years ago, where everything was all schooling and universities and, and language, you know, you know, going back to this kind of almost like caveman state without going through the violence and stuff like that, you know, but it's going back to that, I feed you, I nurture you, I see you, I care for you. And I found it, um, I'll go back to another movie again, when I, when I found it with the people, do you know, when the Avatar, do you know, the Avatars themselves, it was... I loved it. I loved what it stood for. And this, what I look at is us four on this conversation of the avatars, because we are the ones wanting to live in this harmony. And then the ones that are on the other side looking in and saying, look at them airy fairy with their kids, or they're too soft, or they're, you know, they're maybe too hard on society against them. And, but it's not, it's, it's about creating that community and allowing that to grow energetically for me. Yeah. I actually want to touch on the, the seeing thing, actually, because for the first two years, my son didn't talk and we would communicate with our eyes. And we still do that, actually. Most of the time, it's um, when I put him in bed or in the morning, we just we look at each other. And I didn't think 100 percent into it until the other day where um, I was on a video chat with a friend and we were talking about soul gazing, which I'd never done before with a person like besides my son. And all of a sudden we just sat there on the video chat in complete silence and just looked at each other. And you could just tell there was an energetic exchange. We had no words, there were no words. And I don't know how long it went, maybe five or seven minutes. And then we just chuckled and started talking again, but there is something primal there that we don't 
always need to say words. And it's actually very healthy to not always say, I mean, of course it's important to say what you feel, but sometimes there aren't words and to just sit there with that person and just be with them. And just like, instead of saying, I love you, you just go like an avatar. You said avatar and I was immediately like, I see you, which I've never yeah. seen avatar, yeah. but I say, I see you all the time. And everyone's like, oh my God, avatar. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but just being like, I see you. And you just look at them. And there's the just- The nicest thing you could ever say to somebody, more than I love you. I see you means it's far deeper than love. Because love yeah. is attachment. Love is, you know, we are love, but when we use the word love as an attachment, as opposed to what you're actually seeing, and you're attached to that person, thing, or animal, or whatever. But when you say, I see you, for me, I believe it's like you just see their soul. You see them at their purest essence. Regardless of their behavior and stuff to other people, you just, you go in deep and you just see everything about them, and you are them, and they are you, and it's just, far oh, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So, yeah. I see you as, as, for me, is a lot more powerful. Yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. Did you want to go back to touching on labels, Colin? Because you were, we, we kind of deflected <laughs> yeah, away from there, but did you want to yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. that? La labels for me are a swear word, right? Even swear words are enjoyable for me, right? But again, if you swear and you express yourself through it, you get fucking labeled, right? You get labeled as rude. <laughs> or abrupt or do you know an expression for me is really important so being a dancer that was where I was able to channel my expression even though I wasn't happy in life I didn't have purpose I was able to express myself for that time on a stage to feel something now I don't really feel that I need to express much because I live my expression if that makes sense to anybody I don't need to go out and do a hobby or a thing because I am I, I, I just am, you know, and that's the point where it gets to me now where if I swear, I swear, if I don't, I don't. And it, and it just, it, again, it's just me being me. It's, it's like an exclamation mark. Why is that not a swear word? Do you know what I mean? Because that g gives more emphasis, doesn't it? So rather than say, fuck, right, you can just put a big exclamation mark and it says the same thing. So <laughs> going back to labels, I know I go off like Billy Connolly here, the, the, the Scottish comedian. He goes off and he comes back, but when it comes to labels, everything, there's labels for types of parenting, types of children, types of person, types of this, types of that. And then everyone goes into their little groups and becomes divided. So the smart kids won't go with the cool kids. The cool kids won't go with the geeks. The geeks won't go with the musical kids. And it, do you know what? And it starts at school. It starts at school. And it, and it conditions children as they grow up. And then... When they come in to us and they say, you know, I was at school today and, and the big boy, the big girl, they bullied me or, or they said this to me and why? But, or because I don't look as cool as them or because I wear glasses or, you know, these type of things. And it's, this is what happens. They're not taught from a young age that they are one, that they are everything and they can all come together because we're obviously talking about parenting, because parenting's so different and the projection of the parents goes on to them. That's what makes them think they're different. So you get a poor kid that lives in poverty and you get a millionaire kid that comes from everything being given to them. One doesn't know what having it's like and the other one doesn't know what working is like. Do you know? So again, what they've both got, they're both missing on the other side. So what they don't realise is when they're actually coming together from these labels that the parents have then given them, you're the best because we've got lots of money. No, you're the best because you're kind-hearted, you don't need enough stuff. Do you know what I mean? It's like... Every time they go through, everyone's been given a label from a young, young age, and it, and it does affect people when they're older. And it's like, when you, even when I'm sitting speaking to my son, or I'd obviously I speak to my daughter, but she doesn't understand when I'm speaking to my son, what will happen is he will say things like, oh, cool, well, they support that football team, so that makes them bad. And I'm like, absolutely no way. Like, people don't realise that it doesn't matter their religion, or, because in Scotland it's very... It's very staunch, and their religion gets put against it. That you know, put against the uh, how can I put it? Put against the football teams. So it's not a game anymore. Do you know, it's a way of life, and it's very, very harsh. And there's a lot of battles, and people die and fighting. I mean, it's really horrendous. It's really horrible. Um, so again, that again, the parents. I mean, what I witness, and don't get me wrong, I used to 
I'd, I used to go down it and support the football teams and sing the, the shit songs and, the, the, you know, all these things and be a Neanderthal the same as everybody else because that is what I, I habituated to at the time. Now I'm like, what was I thinking? Why? Why? What? What? Are you, are you even joking? So everything that we do, we create the labels. And what happens is because and we spoke about television, mass programming, that's what a television is. As much as it can be educational, and I'm fully aware with all three of you there that we can all say it is educational in either small doses or so that we're not habituated or addicted to watching it, you know, and hypnotised. There's still a lot that we are still taught, and again, through a parenting, that the telly doesn't even do. So we can't just say it's the social media and it's the television because it's the parents. Do you know, you would, you'd you only be watching, so just now, and I, and I want to touch on this very importantly, because this is one of my biggest gripes in the world just now, and if I offend anybody, I'm not sorry, okay? So I was talking earlier about um, my son and I and my daughter and I having a dance and, and doing some dancing and stuff like that, and, do you know, my son and I used to put videos on Facebook and things when I had Facebook, used to put it on there and the family used to all watch it. I used to go, oh, you're so cute. So again, I, I needed the years ago, I needed the, the, the you're a good dad, you're a, do you know, and, and again, I'll admit that, I'll put my hands up, I needed that at the time. But then now I don't need that, so nobody sees anything about my personal life on Instagram or, or my Facebook because it's all about me trying to help others with my posts and trigger them and, you know, do these things and, and try and get their brain going. Again, I'm not always liked, but what I'm finding out now, there's, there's a, a, an app called TikTok. Are we all aware of it? Yeah. A TikTok, TikTok. Yeah. 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 And we've, we've now got parents doing the WAP, WAP dance with their fucking children. Now, I have to bring this up because if anyone watching this or in this parenting group, you deserve kicked in the WAP, okay? Because is this is wrong. So the WAP song stands for wet ass pussy. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, That's I what it's wet ass pussy. Cardi B or whoever her name is sings a bit of WAP, which means wet ass pussy. And it's all about rolling on the floor, gyrating into a carpet or a, a laminated floor, you know, really insinuating sexual moves. Now, I am witnessing 20, 30, 40, 50 year old mums where they are five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old children completely sexualized because that's what their mum does. And their mum's got the under boob out and for the attention and then the kids doing it. And do you know, so what we're doing again, we're projecting this total insecurity of needing this likes and everything else mixed with it's okay in society for a child to know what a WAP is, right? To then get them to do the actual moves to give us some sort of support and extra likes for a child. I mean, what the fuck? I mean, it's like, could you get any more absolutely off the scale mad with it? You know, I mean, it's like, oh! So, and if I see it online, even if I don't know them, I don't troll people, but if it comes up in my feed, I'll ask a question. Do you think that's an appropriate way to act in front of your child? Or do you believe it's appropriate to allow your child to act like you, right? Mostly you'll be abused, told to fuck off, to shut up. You're a narcissist, you're a black. Cool. I asked a question. I want to understand you as a person. I want to understand why you're doing that. And for me doing that, I'm not abusing you. I've triggered you because you know in your unconscious brain that what you're doing is fucking wrong and it's poison. And what you're doing is exploiting your child in a way where, again, they're going to be labelled. So they're talking about women wanting to be more empowered. And because they're allowed to do that, they've got to be able to take their clothes off to feel empowered. That's fine. See if you're doing a nice, natural, loving sense and you want to walk about and be a nudist. That's empowering. That's your power. See if you have to do it to express that onto somebody else to push that agenda or push the agenda that the society is pushing. It's not fucking empowerment. Again, it's, it's coming onto this thing. So there, there's different ways of looking at it. And then if they're doing that and they're standing there with their drop tops and, you know, do you know all the, all the stuff, right? It's the same as their mum that's kind of middle-aged that's now trying to be younger and they're trying to be older. Where's the fucking childhood? Where's that interaction of let's just go to the beach or let's go and dig a hole, let's go and get our feet dirty and ground ourselves and fucking get our toenails all manky? No, we have to have you in a fucking a six-year-old in a thong 
do you know, gyrating on a slippery floor because her mum can't can control herself. You know, I mean, it's fucking, it's, it's some serious, serious bad stuff. So the difference between, again, expressing and, and projecting, uh, we've spoken on this, and we'll touch on it, we'll probably touch on it again for the conversation. It's like, where, where is that person's mental health at that, that's trying to get their, their, their children into this? You know, well, and it's I, like... I would simplify it much more than that, in that, I mean, you made this point anyway, Colin, but it's you either are looking for something outside of you to validate you, and if you are doing that, and I've done plenty of it too, plenty, plenty, plenty. I mean, I'm a, I'm a recovering people pleaser. So I, I know the program very, very, very well. In fact, I spent my 20s and 30s in that program, in the people pleasing program, mostly though to get my father's attention more than probably anyone else. Yeah. But I, so I totally get it. But you, the, and Arwen touched on this too. You, you'll never get validation outside of yourself until, you know, it's, it, it's, what, it's interesting because once you start to actually find your own self-empowerment, that's when, you know, the true validation will come from somebody, yes, going, oh, yeah, you have triggered me there, but, yeah, I mean, I probably do need to look at that inside myself, you know, and that's my, my greatest joy the day when somebody does that because of a question that I've asked them because they've just started on the track that I had to start on and Arwen had to start on and Joe had to start on and you had to start on. Yeah, it's just yeah. the self-responsibility track. But, yeah, the, to me, in everything that you've just said there, um, no matter what it is, it's, it's this thing that th we're teaching a child to look outside of themselves for validation, for, um, for recognition, for, and the, and the longer you do that in life, the less you'll know thyself. Like at the main, the, mod the modality that I use is fast of tea and the, the main, like, I don't know, what do you call it? Modus operandi or whatever um, principle of it is to know thyself. And I think yep. children do know that know themselves if they're given that opportunity. But what you're talking about there is kind of the 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 epitome of that going wrong, you know, like the, like. And I'm not saying that because I, I would I would go there is a possibility that some children came in here to experience that kind of thing, and that there's that angle to it too. Because I'm I'm open to anything, but but. I but agree on ninety nine point nine percent of what you say, but uh, no. Nah. <laughs> yeah, but if but if the parent is is not doing it from an awakened place themselves, yeah, yeah. you know, which in in the sexual industry that that to me it's it you, that's a very enlightened person to be coming from, um, you know, a, a place of awakening in that industry you know i'm sure there are some i'm not saying there isn't but it's 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 big but yeah and then and then those kind of things being projected onto a child because most of us as adults that's our deepest darkest stuff that we have to go into around that stuff so um yeah yeah i i don't i totally get it but it's like are you getting stuff from outside of yourself or are you um yeah like is your child learning to be themselves because that they can teach you how to be yourself if you just let them you know yeah um yeah you're, you're the one who has to do all the learning you know they know yeah. how to be joyful they know how to yeah. be abundant they know how to be that is life that is living that is living being yeah. living is just being happy and, and if, yeah and if yes. you know, as yeah. long as you're not harming somebody or, yeah. or, or, or anything else you know or any animals or anything like that while you're being happy Fucking do it. You know, yeah, do it. Do it. And it do it. Back. Do you remember? Yeah. Did anyone ever watch Friends when it was on? Right. Which one? Friends. Friends. Oh, Friends. <laughs> right, I think everyone watched Friends at some point in their life, right? Yeah. There was one episode that I just watched last week. It was on in the back then, and it was where Phoebe goes running with Rachel. And she oh, runs. My... Right? Now. I love Phoebe. Absolutely, and she has like a people like, hey, but you know, know what actually happened was she was going out and running, Rachel made her feel bad about running like a little girl or somebody that was all over the place, and then it wasn't until she realised why she was doing it, that then she started doing it and she felt all free herself and ran into the horse, but then the horse <laughs> was the karma of her, you know, slagging off Phoebe at the start. But then she carried on doing it and she became a lot happier. So the point yeah. of that is, yeah. is if we just learn from the child 
and learn how to be happy again. And the reason everyone's sad is because they stopped being a child. That's the fucking point, right? Yes. We, we only got sad because we stopped being a child. So let's go back to those child roots. Let's be silly. Do you know, and as much as it's nice to, to engage and feel your child, it's okay to do handstands and fall over and cry and then laugh and pull funny faces and be completely ridiculous because that's what they want, because that's what they are, do you know? And you can do yeah. it in your own expressive way, but just yeah. being a child and it's, it's kind of taking us full circle in the conversation as such, where it's yeah. kind of open to kind of bring it back, you know? And it's like, just be a child. Be that child that really wants you to, to just be them and be at one with them and no judgment. And, and yeah. Again, it goes back to the labels. I mean, we judge on labels. We judge on people behaving. And, but no, as long as we're not hurting anybody or hurting ourselves, let's just, let's just do whatever. Uh, and I'm sure that you girls could probably add on to that. Well, it's impossible to do, I think, if we haven't looked at ourselves, looked at our shadow side and, and done the work. To be able to, like I used to judge every moment of every day, but it was only me I was judging, really. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And yeah it, was, it was difficult. <laughs> it's more difficult to judge than it is not to judge. <laughs> Judging takes away your fucking happiness, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It fucking does. Do you know, don't get me wrong, uh, I have a very dry very, very dry sense of humour, almost to the point where it's like, oh my God, did you just say that? Yeah. And I've got this habit and I've always done it, whereas I'll make a judgment and turn it into comedy, right? So I will pick something, so I'll never slag somebody off, but because the way my brain works, I'll, I'll take something that and then I'll, I'll make a joke about the person I'm sitting with. And it's not to put the person down, it's to make that person laugh. Does that make sense? Yes. It's still a judgment. So again, none of us are perfect. We all do things that, that we don't want to do, but part of that I don't want to let it go because that's fucking funny. Do you know what I mean? But... <laughs> I have the same dilemma myself. I do exactly the same thing. And I'm questioning now if I'm still if the turning the criticisms, the judgments into jokes is still actually a low vibration place to be. It is. It is. But then again, do we do we stop doing that? And uh, if we're at a place of love, right? Love isn't funny. Seeing somebody isn't funny, right? And this is where we've got to sometimes know where we've got to dip into that kind of dark side again to be able to bring out the, the, the frequency being lifted. So the comment would have been low, but then what we're lifting up in that person is going to come out of them and then and leave. And then we can talk about higher stuff after it. So what you're saying is right, it is very low vibrational, very, very low energy, but if we lift ourselves back out of that again, it's like not allowing, it's allowing somebody to complain to you. It's a similar type of energy. Yeah, but I think, I think my dad used to always say that um, comedy is the highest form of intelligence. So in, in the spectrum, you know, this vast spectrum of, of things where we're educating people, I think what he meant by that, and I agree with him, is that the comedy is the one that will shift people the fastest. Humor, humor is is if we want to shift people, it's better to use humor than to use anything else. Yeah. So so because because people can, you know, like like hopefully we can all laugh at ourselves and our. Um, I was talking to a parent on a call the other night, and we were talking about this, and she said. Ilka, humour is and comedy is truth. And I thought that was a very <laughs> profound yeah. statement. Yeah, because it is truth and, and that truth is difficult to look at until you're ready to go, oh God, and say out loud on a on this on a forum like this that I've been a people pleaser my whole life. Or are one to say, you know, I've been a victim and we all put our hand up. Like not everyone's ready to do that yet, but if we can make a joke about ourselves and bring somebody else in, yeah. Yeah, you know, that to me, the humour, uh, other forms of education to me just don't work as well because, you know, that's why they were, that's why Kevin Hart packs a stadium and people learn stuff when they go there watching him do that, like watching yeah. him, you you know, make fun of himself and to say how short he is and he has to jump up and 
stuff. And we piss ourselves laughing as well. And I mean, that's one of the techniques I use is to get people to laugh and then they'll collapse some of their patterns. Um, yes. So I still think out of all the uh, waking up techniques there are on the planet, humor is the best one. No, um, definitely. And, yeah. And yeah, you can, you can see people in that, but they've got to be ready to, and sometimes yeah. a little joke is something that, you know, no, seriously, humor, oh, being a parent, yeah, no, like being a parent with humor is so crucial because prior to being able to laugh at the little things, I would feel guilt and shame. For example, I was on a video chat the other day and usually my son comes and gets me when he has to go number two. He did it this time. And so um, a little bit later, I hung up the call and I came into the kitchen, which it, he has those, his potty near the kitchen because he doesn't, he has a fear of the bathroom working on it. Um, <laughs> um, I come into the kitchen and there's just poop in the potty. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's like this magical ghost poop just happened. And uh, I realized like he didn't want to come get me. He did it himself. And at first prior, I would feel shame. I wasn't there for him when he needed yeah. me. Yeah. But then I realized he was shit by himself. I'm just like, in full like empowerment for my son right now. I was like, and then I realized I had shit in my kitchen and I was like, oh, okay, I need to get this. <laughs> so it's like, you have to laugh at this stuff because if you don't, it's going to eat your inside. Yeah. yeah, that's the other thing. Yes, yeah, I love it. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Uh, so that good good laughing just laughing laughing a lot yeah just fucking just chilling man just laughing and this is what people go and i want to say just before we go that we wrap this up joe yeah. i feel like i know you from linkedin <laughs> Ooh. is that possible oh i think i was on there a couple of years ago but i haven't like even been in there haven't looked at it at all which is something on my list of things to do which is quite interesting so i don't know something to do with you, you didn't you will now. what's that if you didn't know her from linkedin before you I will now i don't know but i so know her face and i don't know where it's from i do some comedy skits um and i call them the shit show with joe and it's basically self-deprecating humor where <laughs> and giving permission to others they see me in themselves and they're laughing with me and at me but really it's it's what they're seeing in themselves hey, well, i'm gonna check that out because i like that <laughs> it's very good That's my little vibrational shit i love it <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah, if I'm... you could if, if there's one thing one really powerful thing to to wrap up that you would like to leave the the parents with Arvin or me uh, Colin, if you can go. Oh, first. me, yeah. Um, be yourself. That's 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 it. Be yourself. Be who you are. Understand who you are. And do you know if it's Elka and Joe, if you want to go to them, or you want to go to Arvin, and they've got their own ways of being able to get people into to understanding their soul, their spirit, these type of things. Get the girls to use it, utilize them. If they want to reach out to me and understand their uniqueness behavior wise, it's something different. Get them to come and utilize it. Come and speak to us. Do you know? Yeah. Strength shows when you're asking for help. Every coach needs a coach. Every person needs somebody that they can go to. It doesn't matter if you're the best coach in the world. It doesn't matter what level you're at. You go for somebody that you can approach that sees you for you. Do you know? So if you've been a shit parent or you want to change your way of parenting, find out what you're doing wrong by asking somebody else. What would you do? Can you see that anything I'm doing wrong? Listen to them. Do you know, take the criticism. But you look powerful in asking them because it shows that you're willing to be open to it. Most people just habituate to that to that one way of working because they're scared of change or they're, they're scared in case they get judged or they're scared in case they do it wrong. Painting is trial and error. There's not one manuscript that we get given. So all I can say to people is be yourself, be open to make, making mistakes, don't rectify the mistakes, just change your ways. You can't right or wrong, but you can change it. You know, you can change your behavior, you know? So I just wish people were more self-aware and I know that's where the kind of conversation came from I, and understand that what we've spoken about tonight, there will be some issues that we've spoken about um, 
the mood people will feel on a, on a deeper level. And that's why I'm so grateful for the space you girls have opened up and, and invited me on. Three of you, I'm very, very grateful to be able to come and express myself, probably overly sometimes, but um, to, to be able to do that in a way where I can be myself and not feel judged by 400 or 4,000 people, it doesn't matter, that, that's going to be watching the video because we all need to learn. We all need to learn, and we only learn through, and John taught me this, you learn from commission, not omission. So you've got to do the deed to learn, whether it's right or wrong. You can't miss something in case you don't. You know, yeah. and I think that's what a lot of people find. So, yeah, be yourself. Learn from your mistakes. Learn by making mistakes. Not on purpose. Don't go and do things that you know it's going to be wrong. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Go and do things that you know right. You know, because you might be making that right decision and, and you're fighting against your gut. And a lot of people are in their head too much. You know, I purposely ask every client, every single client that comes to me. The, so I do tarot reading full time. Now, that's what I do. But I'm a tarot reader full time. And I do it all over the world from my desk at home. And I'm full time and it's awesome. And I love it. But I make a point of making every single person understand the importance of meditation the importance of meditation, being able to sit and focus. And I want to tell one thing here just before we go. I know I'm, I'll probably keep you here for another two hours, right? <laughs> scientific fact, scientific, real science, not government science, real scientific fact that the female brain has five thoughts at every one time. Okay? So just now, you girls will be focused on me talking. One will be saying, I wish it would shut up. What I was saying, the dog was licking my feet. I've got the kids to get ready tomorrow morning. And tomorrow night's mac and cheese is going to be fucking awesome, right? Oh, this is just what happens, right? A man only has one thought, right? So that means I can focus on everything onto one thing. However, if I'm focused and somebody takes my focus away, like the dog going out of the room earlier, I had to look up and I had to stop talking. Do you know what I mean? When it happened, because I can't do that. Yeah. Women have this process in their brain where they're able to do five things at the one time. That's why you can smoke a cigarette, drink a glass of wine, be on the phone, paint your toenails and create a piece of art. But what you're not doing is you're not focusing it onto one thing so you're spread quite thinly, right? And this is where I believe women have to focus on maybe three things at the one time as opposed to five because it means if the shit hits the fan, what they then they've got an extra thought process for each one of the things. And this is what John and I are trying to teach with flow and flow says, flows down to one thought, okay? Meditation is flowing, it's one thought. You're focusing your breathing and that's it. You can't switch your brain off because you would die, but you can focus it down to only your breathing so that everything else goes off. If you've got five thoughts and you take two of them away, so you've only got the conversation, me shut up, and then you'll get tomorrow night's mac and cheese, and you get these two spaces to be able to fill in with, oh my God, there's a disaster. You need to come here right now. That's four. You still got one. And it's about overcoming so that you can get to that point. Now, if you're a parent, and especially a female, okay, females, if you get a female brain and you get a male brain, a male brain is a female's brain damaged in four areas, right? So if I damage it in four areas, I have then got a man's brain if I'm a woman. Right? But then I, I can't build this man brain up to five thoughts. It's fucking impossible. So this is why, as well as women, and we'll talk about partnerships a bit. Sorry, I can't finish just yet. Um, we'll talk about being at home. If the child is lucky to have a healthy two-parent relationship, great. Okay, not all of us have got that. We are working or whatever, and that's okay. It's not that we're unlucky, but it's lucky for the child to have that and for it not to be ruined if it works all together. We can't have a bad relationship. You would rather be on your own. Do you know what I mean? But if they are lucky to have that and the way that they watch the interaction with the parent, so the male role will be to focus on that child. As soon as they lose focus for a second, they're not engaged. The mum can be engaged, but still have four or five other things, but it means that she's not fully immersed because she's still got the other things going on. Men can't do that. You know, so when women and men understand how their brains physically work, and I don't mean mentally, spiritually, you know, we've got the mental, physical and spiritual world, that's 
our equilateral triangle of life, I call it. So it's the mental, the physical, and the spiritual. Bring them all together as equal, but then get balance, you know? But if we don't understand how our brain works and we don't understand how our brain is able to be used and how we use it, what we then do is we we then start kind of spreading ourselves too thin. So if you get five thoughts and I give you a sixth one, I give you a sixth thought and I say, this is the disaster for today or I need you to do this for me. That's the point. Like, I can't take any more of this. I've had enough. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> right. And this is where it happens. And it can be the smallest thing. And people go, I'm stressed out. I'm anxious. I'm depressed. No, you're not. You just don't understand how your fucking brain works. Because the amount of women that have anxiety over the amount of men is fucking mental. So women think they're the weaker sex and they've got a weaker brain. It's actually stronger when used the way that it was intended to be used and the way it was developed, you know? So if anyone wants to, to talk about it more, I'm happy to reach out on Instagram or I can send through some videos, I can send through some things. Um, also working on your intangible drivers, Arvin, you've experienced um, a bit of the intangible driver stuff. So your personality is what, it changes your life. I give you a million pounds, you'll be happy. I take a million pounds off you, you'll be really sad and upset and angry. But two days ago, you didn't have anything. So what the fuck? So it's, it's all situational, right? I mean, your personality is situational in your life. Your intangible drivers, like your soul when it's born, that's who you are and this is how you gain and lose energy. As you say, you're either getting it external, you're getting it internal, right? You can either gain energy or you can lose energy in every single thing that you do in your life. I have gained energy tonight from you girls, so thank you. And it's not from sucking yours, it's for me being able to express mine, okay? Because I care and I'm compassionate about the children and, and upbringings and stuff, okay? But if I didn't like to speak and you had me force me on here, I'd be losing energy at every word that came out of my mouth. Yeah. So you're in drivers, I would love it and I'll send the link over and I would love you to do the test and send you the videos based on who you are and it'll even help you on your journey. It's the stuff that you can't put into words that we were talking about earlier. Um, and if the women, you can share it with the women and you can just let them know when they, they fill it in, just say they call and put them on. Um, and then they might, and even the dads as well, they, they get to know more about themselves and what mm. other people as opposed to what they think they see and what, how they fix things or how they do things as opposed to how they think they do it, you know? Um, so, yeah, so that takes me back to being yourself again and, and gaining that energy through everything that you do. So another rant that took another 10 minutes. <laughs> it could be cool to, to do it again and come back and, and talk about relationships. And I love the analogy of the 5-1 is, uh, is so easy to remember. And it reminds me um, of a book I read and talking about, like, this is why women can lose their shit when the man can walk over a dirty pair of socks and then he thinks she's fucking crazy because it's just a dirty pair of socks, but it's actually the sixth thought and we just can't. Yeah. If the man was focusing on going to the toilet or the kitchen that he wasn't focusing on picking things up, but yeah. a woman was focused on that line on the floor, him walking past it, this and fucking, and that's the point where they go off the head. I would yeah. love to have a talk, a proper talk on relationships uh, and how we can better them. How we, I would love to come back with you girls because again, inevitably, the relationships that we have around our children is very important as well. And we yeah. still want to be us in a relationship. If we can't be us in a relationship, we're not going to be ourselves with our children either. Totally. Do you know, we, we, we might be wet ass pussying about the floor. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying, right? So, yes, again, yeah. if we have a partner, there's a good chance that there was a healthy relationship. We wouldn't be wanting the external kind of val validity. So, we probably yep. wouldn't be on TikTok rolling about the floor gyrating with our kids. So, Again, we can talk about this if you want to do it again. I'm, I would love to. It's been an absolute fucking pleasure by having the three of you on. It's been really, really nice. I'm saying that it's my show. It's your show. <laughs> been on the show with you. <laughs> it's great. It's yeah, it's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And and I could I just before our one speaks. Uh, my my new the way you say parenting, um, in with your Scottish accent, it sounds like painting to me. But I just thought, isn't that so much better? 
I want to call parenting painting because oh, we're like, it. it's like art. Yes. And I was like, oh my God, let's change it. Let's change the word parenting painting. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, so good. yeah. What would, what would you like to finish up with, Arwen? What would you say to parents if you could give them? Um, yeah. Okay. I, I'll try to keep it simple, but first, first, I really do want to do this again because with the intangible drivers and even if you believe in intangible drivers or um human design with co-parenting to figure out who each other are and your child it makes mm -hmm. everything a lot better and then you can throw in masculine feminine energy energy if you believe in that stuff but yeah definitely do this again um yeah. i'm gonna keep it as simple as i can let's hope i do this um <laughs> if there was something i'm gonna start from the foundation and first say you are not broken. That is the first thing you need to recognize before going down this path of self-healing is that you are not broken. No matter what has happened in your past, no matter what you've been through, it did not break you because you're still here today. And then the next thing would be to take responsibility of all the actions that you've done with your entire life. Um, it is a very hard but worthwhile journey and it's not always going to be bright and sunny. You're gonna think, I've done it. I've made it to the next level. Welcome to Jumanji, here's the next level. Like the, it's gonna keep happening. Everyone keeps thinking that you keep reaching higher states of consciousness and you just keep going up. I'm like, you're gonna keep getting opportunities for growth. It doesn't mean they're gonna be flowers, but you need to take them as flowers. Like that's what you need to do. You need to look at this and be like, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this trigger. Every time I get triggered, I literally go, thank you. Because without this trigger, I cannot heal myself. And another plot twist. A lot of people don't like when I say this, they get really pissed off. You can never fully heal yourself because every day you embark on a new adventure that's going to trigger something with else inside you. You're gonna find something else that you don't like going on. Like you're never fully healed. And then that sounds like like a devastation being like, what do you mean I'm never gonna be fully healed? Like the whole mission in life is to be healed and happy. And I'm like, your mission in life is to self-discovery. That's it, yeah. self-discovery. Yeah. And then healing yourself as much as you can with love and light and then just giving it out. Can you fill your cup up to where you know it can stay full forever. And then that's when you can give it out to the rest of the world. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, well done. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you thank so you much, both. Yes. And thanks for setting this up for us, Arwen. Awesome. Not a problem. Yeah, Definitely. Thank you, we'll do it again. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no we'll be we'll back for a um, video too about relationships with, uh, with when you've got kids too. Yeah. yeah. Nice. That'll be awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay.